trade deadline has come and gone. The Montreal Canadiens general manager Kent Hughes had told us it was going to take a lot to trade Arturi Lekkinen. I guess the Colorado Avalanche offered a lot because he traded him. What did he get in return? A 20-year-old, six foot two, right-handed defenseman. He also traded Brett Kulak, who a couple of days ago he told us he liked. In return, he got a 26-year-old NHL defenseman and a draft pick. And goalie Andrew Hammond was traded as well for a 23-year-old centerman who's been playing in the American Hockey League. Other than that, there was a hockey game that took place at the Bell Center. The Canadians, not their best performance, but they hung in there. As a matter of fact, the game went to overtime. They lose to the Boston Bruins. We'll break it all down, and I'll bring in an expert in terms of hockey prospecting who knows all these kids and all these prospects, Byron Bader, a creator of hockey prospecting, coming up on the Sick Podcast. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast. With Tony Maradero. The Sickest Montreal Canadiens Podcast. And now, a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadiens win the Stanley Cup. Sports Entertainment. Like no other. Brought to you by 8.6 Beer. Intense by nature. And Lacage. If the last time you went to Lacage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you went back to Lacage. The menu will surprise you. Marinero, the sick podcast brought to you once again, yes, by 8.6 Beer. Intense, like me, by nature, like me. The beer for those who follow their instinct and live their passions the way I do here on the podcast in order to make their mark in the way we're trying to do. And also brought to you in part by Lacage. If the last time you went to Lacage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you go back to Lacage. The menu will surprise you. Speaking of going back, I hope that you will join me, our producers, and our sick team at La Cage de Carry on Rue des Jockeys on Saturday, March 26th, hockey night in Canada when the Montreal Canadiens host their arch rival nemesis, the Toronto Maple Leafs. We're going to be there. We're going to watch it. We're going to hang out. There's going to be some prizes, cool people. We're going to have a good time. It's going to be so good to be out again. RSVP by calling Lacage de Carry to save your spot. Show up with your friends. I look forward to meeting you all. It is the Sick Podcast, and you can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram at the Sick Podcast. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's absolutely free. And the best part of following us on all these social media channels is that if you do, you can be notified when we upload an episode. Or when we go live. All right, okay. Let me start with NHL trade deadline day, specifically with the Montreal Canadiens, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the other teams do, unless, of course, they were doing business with the Montreal Canadiens. The Canadiens made three trades. One minor deal. Andrew Hammond traded. There you go, to the New Jersey Devils in exchange for forward Nate Schnarr a 23-year-old centerman who was playing for Utica in the American Hockey League. He'll report to the Laval Rocket. Brett Kulak. Kent Hughes told us he liked him, but he traded him. In return for defenseman William Lagason, a conditional second-round pick in 2022, and a seventh-round pick in 2024. More on Lagason a little bit later on. More on Schnarr a little bit later on. And Arturi Lekkinen. I told you here on the Sick Podcast, I like him, but his value was at a high. I think Lekkinen is more the player we saw in the last four years than the player that we saw this year who got hot for a three-week stretch. And I told you I would have traded him, and they traded him. And I told you that I thought his value was a first-round pick and a prospect. The Canadians received um, for defense for 
For Arturi Lekkinen, the Canadians received defenseman Justin Barron from the Colorado Avalanche, a former first-round pick, and a second-round pick in 2024. So they got exactly pretty much what I thought they were going to get for him. And we'll talk to you about Justin Barron a little bit later on with uh, Byron Bader, creator of Hockey Prospecting. But, you know, let, let me just get to the game. The Canadians played the Boston Bruins. I'll tell you exactly how it went down. We'll take a look at the lineup right now, which will be on the screen. I'll read it out to you for those who won't be watching and will be listening. Suzuki centering Anderson to his right and Caulfield to his left. Dauphin with Hoffman on his right and Pitlick on his left. Dvorak centering your third line with Armia on his right and Drouet on his left. And Evans fourth line with Byron on his right and Pizet on his left. Romanov and David Savard back in the lineup. Edmondson and Petrie, Schooneman and Weidman, and Jake Allen got the start in goal. In period number one, Yoel Armia tries to lob the puck out of the zone. It's intercepted by Clifton, a pass to Halla. He finds Marchand in close. It's one nothing for the Boston Bruins. On to period number two, they go. Byron to Romanov to David Savard playing his first game in the longest time. A nice move, a backhand shot, which is deflected. And he's able to beat Swayman. It's 1-1. On to period number three, they go with the Montreal Canadiens killing a penalty. Brad Marchand uncharacteristically makes a bad play. His pass is picked off by Yoel Armia, who's off to the races. He goes on a breakaway. Top corner, it goes 2-1 for the Montreal Canadiens. With 2.59 left in regulation, and Jake Allen standing on his head, who had made a bunch of saves, and the Canadiens trying to pull out the win. Unfortunately, Anderson goes to the same side where Caulfield is, it leaves his side open, and it goes from Coyle to Smith, who finds Clifton. He beats Jake Allen. He ties the game at two. On to overtime, they go, and the only shot of the overtime session was the Boston Bruins who got it. It proves to be the winner, of course. Caulfield tries to, the Canadians are in the offensive zone. Caulfield tries to find Suzuki with a pass. It's a bad pass. Petrie moves in on it, tries to get to it, but it doesn't. It goes the other way. Halla is able to find Brad Marchand. Uh, Petrie skates back. He's, he's hustling back, but he picks up his guy. Suzuki, unfortunately, can't keep pace with Marchand because Suzuki at one point has lost his stick or threw his stick. And Marchand is so, so cool, calm, collected, the poise. He fakes a shot. He lifts his back leg. He takes it to his backhand. He beats Jake Allen, and the Boston Bruins win by a score of 3-2. to two. The Bruins outshot the Canadians 14-8 in period number one. The Canadians edged them in period number two, 15-14. The Bruins, again, outshot the Canadians 17-5 in period number three. And once again, one nothing was the shots in the overtime session for the Boston Bruins. Brad Marchand picks up a couple of goals. The Bruins win by a score of 3-2. to two. They outshot the Canadians 46-28. Uh, 0 for 4 on the power play. The Bruins 0 for 2 for the Canadians. The Canadians didn't play their best game. It was a battle in the trenches. Boston was better. Jake Allen stood on his head. But at the end of the day, what matters is the entertainment value. It was once again a very, very entertaining game at the Bell Center. And that's the way it ended. Let's get back to the trades if we can. Martin St. Louis said at the end of the game, it was not only a tough day for the players. St. Louis had said earlier in the morning that if it was up to him, there would be no games on trade deadline day because it's so tough on everyone. And I agree with them. The fact that some players are at practice, they get pulled off the ice and stuff like that. They have to gather their bags. They have to get to the airport. Doesn't make any sense to me. If you can give them one day off during the year, give them that day off during the year, Christmas as well. So I had a couple of days off. But anyway, there you have it. The Canadians made three trades. There were a couple of players that you were wondering if they were going to get traded who didn't. One was Jeff Petrie. Another one was Jake Allen, maybe even Christian Dvorak to a lesser degree. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But I'd like to bring in creator of Hockey Prospecting. He's a NHL draft consultant. He's done work for pretty much and been featured pretty much everywhere. Byron Bader, how are you? I'm doing great, Tony. How are you? Very, very well. Thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. All right, so it's the Sick Podcast, and a shout-out to SportBuffShop.com for all of your officially licensed sports apparel. If one of your favorite players, whether it was Arturi Lekkinen or Brett Kulak, moved or you want to pick up a jersey of one of the players that's going to be coming back, 
You can go to sportbuffshop.com. You can also pick up our sick merchandise. Use code 615 for 15% off on all of their items. And a shout out to Manscaped. And use the code 620 for 20% off. Manscaped.com. For men, real men like me. Smooth like a baby, huh? All right. Let's get back to business. Byron, you know a lot of the, you know these players very well, um, especially Justin Barron that the Canadians picked up from the Colorado Avalanche. You've been following him closely. I'd like to bring up a chart that you put together so somebody smart like you can explain it to somebody not smart like me. This is your chart. This is Justin Barron, a 20 year old, six foot two, right handed defenseman. He used to play for the Colorado Avalanche. Now he's a Montreal Canadian. Byron, if you can explain this chart to me from A to Z, I'm all ears. Okay. So, yeah. So basically what the chart is, is it's, it's using something called NHL equivalency. So basically every league has its own translation of how it relates back to the NHL in terms of, you know, a point in the queue is worth a certain amount versus a point in the NHL. And then every league is different. So, you know, the queue is different from the OHL, which is different from NCAA, which is different from all the Euro leagues. So when you basically equate everything and give it this score, so that's the NHLE on the left side, um, that's basically how they're scoring in that certain league would relate back to the NHL essentially in their first season. And this is basically looking back over the past 30 years and kind of taking the average of everybody who's sort of made those jumps. And that's how you kind of come up with those equivalencies. But by doing so, um, and this is this is the work that I do and, and this is the model I built is you can also use this this equivalency score as a as sort of a standardized score to put every player essentially on the same level playing field. And you can look back at players over the past 30 years and look back at what they look like and the jumps they were making in their equivalency score. So again, that score on the left side. And basically what you find is there's these patterns that emerge for players and they essentially, you know, the ones that tend to make the NHL and tend to do very well in the NHL, um, they tend to move through this equivalency and they tend to get higher and higher by the time that they're making the NHL, they have this really high equivalency. And the younger you're doing this, like even, you know, a six month difference can be a huge difference with this type of stuff. So that's the, that's basically what it's based off of. And then you have the probabilities on the right side. So um, the NHL or probability is kind of self-explanatory, but it's basically predicting whether the player is going to make 200 plus games in the NHL. And again, this is going back and, you know, the model's based on looking back over the past 30 years and looking at the players that look like this and the ones that sort of follow this certain progression or this archetype. And, you know, this is a percentage that it gives out. So, you know, Justin right. Barron has a very, very high chance of becoming an NHLer. All right. Uh, so depending on where he played his junior hockey, yeah, there's a formula that is put together that will tell us what that would equate to at the next level or the level after that. Is that it? Yeah, kind of like it, it basically puts everything on the same level playing field so that you can okay. look at these hundreds of prospects every year and you can look at them. Yeah. On the same level okay. and, and see them all equally. So for those who will not watch this on video, but will listen to it on audio and iHeartRadio or all other social media apps, what are those numbers that you have on the left-hand side? Explain those please. So those are the NHL equivalency. So basically okay. uh, his, he has an equivalency of 20, Baron has an equivalency of 26 right now. So okay. theoretically the average of all the players that have hit a level, you know, jump from the AHL to the NHL on average, they would score about 26 points over 82 games in their first okay. NHL season is okay. essentially what it's saying. Yeah. All right. So it's essentially saying that based on other comparables, he would equate to a 26-point player in the National Hockey League, plain and simple. Yes, on Perfect. average. Okay, now, um, do comps and full comps. Explain us that and explain. talk to us about some of the names on your chart. Right, so the, the there's two comps. So there's the D0 comps, which is essentially their draft year comps, but I mean, 
It's also looking at overagers, but it's basically looking at what they look like in their first eligible draft year and who also look like that. So when you're looking at Baron, you have Aaron, Eric Chernak, uh, Nathan Beaulieu, Oli Mata, uh, Brendan Bell and Brian Campbell. And that's just five players that look like this. There's a lot of players that look like Baron at the draft. So it basically takes a random five if it finds five of the same ones. And yeah. so that's that's kind of what you're looking at. So it's kind of the top five. And then the full comps are basically looking at um, – so the players, I track them for a five-year period. So essentially from the pre-draft year till three years after they're drafted. So Baron is currently four years into his track. So he's not fully there yet. So you're kind of looking at him four years um, through his development pattern. So who he compares to right now um, are Ryan Murray, Jonathan Blum, Darian Hatcher, Matt Dumba, and Duncan Keith. And like I said, these comps go back to roughly about 1990 um, and then all the way up to 2021 and it's looking at all the NHLers that have played at least a hundred games. And so that's, that's the top five that kind of come up there. So those are the the five that he looks like most like right now at this moment. That's, that's interesting because obviously Duncan Keith, who's still playing um, has had an amazing career, right? Mm-hmm. Darian Hatcher had a very good career. Matt Dumba uh, has turned into a pretty good defenseman over the past couple of years and so there, you know, those are there's different levels there, right? Those are some players that had much better careers than others. So, but those are not the players at the end of their careers. Those are the players pretty much at the same rate that he's going right now around the same time. Correct? Yeah, they have the same okay. development pattern at this stage in their okay. their respective development. So when they were two years removed from the draft, essentially. On to the right-hand side, you talked about probabilities, star and NHLer. What are those numbers under star? So the star probability, that's essentially um, trying to predict a offensive star defenseman and a forward. So for a star, it's it's somebody over their NHL career that basically generates roughly 40 points over 82 games over an entire season. And then for Point every a, other game, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then for a forward, it's roughly about 60 points every 82 games. And, you know, that's that's essentially like out of everybody drafted, only about 3% of everybody drafted kind of reaches this level. So that's my yeah. star level that I've created in, in my model. So, yeah, so that's what those those probabilities mean. And then, like I said, the NHL yeah. um, one is is making 200 games in the NHL. It's, it's a formula that makes sense. Um, for a defenseman, a point every other game. For a forward, two points every three games. That's basically yeah. how it works out to pretty much. Okay. Yeah, roughly, and, yeah. And so now if you take a look at, those are the star numbers. Now the NHL numbers, 42% to the, in D0, 62% in D1, and 79% in D2. Once again, can you try to explain that to me? And there I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> so so that's just watching how he's progressing since the draft. So the, the draft is his D0 year. So Okay. Um, the way it's kind of, you know, in, in the stats world, you have the D minus one is essentially their pre-draft year. And then their D zero is their first eligible draft year. And then the, the D one is the okay. the next year after the draft. And then the D two is the next year after that. And then the D three is where the track ends. And after that, the player kind of is what they is, is what they is type thing. Um, so yeah. it goes all the way from essentially the 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 D zero to the D three there. So Got it's just it. watching his progression. So you can see that. Justin Barron's having a nice, nice kind of expected, um, you know, NHL or probability growth and his, his star probabilities growing yeah. a little bit too there. So, and you mentioned via Twitter and by the way, um, I would, uh, I would suggest that you follow him on Twitter, Byron, B Y R O N M Bader, B A D E R creator of hockey prospecting uh, great follow. You mentioned earlier today on Twitter, that Justin Barrow, uh, Justin Barron reminds you, I think somebody asked you, you know, how does he compare to Gooley? And so I think you came out with a chart and you compared him to another Canadian's prospect, Caden Gooley. Let's take a look yep. at that chart. All right. Here they are side by side. So are their numbers comparable? Yeah. I mean, the, the big thing with Gooley, like they, they kind of start off like really at the similar spot there. Um, you can see in their draft year, it's it's almost the exact same number and they have the same probability. And essentially what happens is, is Gooley misses 
basically his whole um, post draft year. He plays a couple games in the NHL. He plays a couple games in the WHL. And I think he was injured kind of for the rest of it. So he only really gets into five games. So it's not enough for me to sort of, you know, run him through my model and put that, that, that data into the model. I'm kind of looking for at least a, you know, you know, a 10 to 20 game sample there. So him kind of missing that year, he kind of remains the same. And then he's taken a nice jump up this year, not quite as high as Baron, but you can, you know, you can probably think that if Gooley actually did play last year and didn't miss the whole year, then he wouldn't kind of be, you know, sitting for 15 months. And then he's playing this year. Like you'd kind of be at the same level as Baron because Baron yeah. got in quite a few games in the queue last year. So they're, they're on a pretty similar trajectory actually. So you know, right. if, it, if it was a normal circumstance and COVID didn't exist, they would probably look almost identical in terms of their, their progression. All right. So they get a 20 year old, six foot two, right handed defenseman. And in return for Brett Kulak, who they sent to Edmonton, let's talk about this now. They get a 26 year old, six foot two, left handed defenseman in William Ligason. And you have a chart on him as well. Let's take a look at that. All right. Here it is. Talk to us about Lagason. Yeah. So the thing with Lagason, I mean, he's, he's a bit different from Baron. I mean, Baron's obviously, um, you know, he's kind of the big piece in um, the Lekkonen trade um, along with the second rounder, you know, he's a recent first rounder with Lagason. I mean, he's really, you know, he's a shutdown defenseman kind of a, you know, he'd be like a seventh or eighth defenseman type thing. Really doesn't produce a lot of offense never really has in terms of his development you can see his his equivalency there on the on the left is really really low especially compared to Barron um you know it's like a third of what Barron has had and 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 the big thing there is with Barron you could see growth every year you know he's jumping from 12 to the high teens now he's in the high 20s type thing with with Lagason you know he basically stagnates he basically stays at the same level you know even though he's jumping around different leagues he goes from from the super elite and then he goes to the ushl and then the ncaa he doesn't really make any big jumps so when you look at a guy like this like very few of these guys actually make the nhl um you know his his chance of making the nhl after his full track was 14 percent, and you know he's gotten into 57 games now you know he, maybe he he kind of sneaks over 100 games or maybe he gets to 200 games but you know when you look at the history of players that have this exact same archetype very few of them actually even make the nhl and when i mean make the nhl like you look at them and it's like you know zero games for almost all of them and then there's yeah. there's a couple of them that make it right so i mean yeah. with him like your ceiling is probably you know like a guy like joel edmondson or adam mcquade like that's what you're kind of looking at with a guy like like Lagason. i mean there's you know defensive defenseman not too much offensive upside there um probably won't play all the time but yeah so he's he's a lot he's a lot different from baron and his profile for sure i've uh, seen him drop the gloves on a couple occasions with josh anderson and josh anderson did pretty well but i guess lagason said if you can't beat him join him actually he didn't dictate the trade he was traded to the canadians in return for brett kulak all right you have something on nate schnarr and and you know what can you tell us about him a 23 year old american hockey league centerman who joins the canadians in exchange for andrew hammond who goes to new jersey uh, Kent Hughes saying he thanked Hammond uh, for, you know, bailing the Canadians uh, out when they needed a goalie and uh, liked the way he played here and is hoping that he gets a shot in New Jersey to re resurrect his career. Uh, my question to you is, will Schnarr be able to be a full-time NHL player? Yeah, I mean, as you can kind of expect, because, I mean, Hammond's sort of a, you know, third or fourth string goalie there. You know, he doesn't project overly high. He's drafted in 2017, so he's He's essentially five years removed from being drafted, hasn't played a single NHL game. You know, I think in my model, he profiles at about a 25% chance of making the NHL. Um, you know, and what you want to see is, is basically at this point, you know, he's kind of past his track and you start to get really diminishing returns at this point. So you want to start to see like big jumps in the AHL if he is going to make it. And he's, yeah. he's kind of starting to get there, but I, th I think the jumps are, are, you know, even too small at this point that he's going to make it. So he'll be, He'll be a long shot, I would say, to certainly, you know, maybe he gets in a, a cup of coffee. But to become an NHLer, I would say he's a long shot for sure. In ending, what do you say to uh, Kent Hughes' trades uh, in terms of revamping the Canadians, wanting to make them younger, wanting to add some prospects who will play in the National Hockey League, wanting to stockpile draft picks as assets? Uh, you think he won the day? Yes or no? 
Yeah, I think he did fantastic. I mean, he traded away the three big pieces he traded away were all on expiring deals. And, you know, he, he cleaned up on, on those trades. I mean, he got like, I think seven picks and, you know, four of them are in the first two rounds. So I think he did really well. And um, yeah, I think that's going to really help with the rebuild going forward and, and kind of shoot, shoot uh, the Canadians ahead along this rebuild. Byron, very much appreciate you taking time for me, man. Thanks. We'll do it again sometime soon. You bet. No problem. All right. There you have it. Creator of Hockey Prospecting who breaks it down and broke down those players and hope you know a little bit more about them now than you did before. What I can tell you is this, is that, um, first of all, um, you know, I've been very impressed with Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon since day one. I've told you on this podcast already on a couple of occasions that I believe that they will be the Montreal Canadiens' most successful management team and do better work than other management teams with all due respect to other management teams that have passed here since the Canadians last won the cup in 1993. I, I think they're surgeons. Um, um, I, I think, um, I think they're very analytical. I think they're business-like. I think they're, they're, they're stockbrokers. I think they're all of this all in one. Uh, it's clear that they have a plan. It's clear that they're executing on that plan. And I also believe, I'm not saying that they knew they were going to trade, Lekin in and they knew they were going to trade Kulak. Um, but I believe that they thought that if they pump their tires and they got word out around the league that they really like these players and they don't want to move them and they were so important uh, to the fabric of the team and all that stuff that other teams were going to overpay a little bit for them and then they were going to move them. And I think that's exactly what happened. So I think the way they've gone about this is absolutely brilliant. And think about it. A lot of people in the city wanted them to move Jeff Petrie because he hasn't played well. He's got three years left on his contract at $6.25 million. But Kent Hughes told us all along that it had to make sense for both parties. Meaning uh, if he didn't think if he wasn't going to get, if he wasn't going to get what he wanted to get for Petrie, he wasn't going to trade him and he didn't get what he wanted to get for Petrie and he didn't trade him. So he also said that he came very close to trading Shea Weber's contract but unfortunately to no avail. So uh, that's something that you would probably think is probably going to happen at the draft or sometime in the off season for Weber's contract and for Jeff Petrie. And also uh, in terms of um, Jake Allen, um, he told us he wasn't going to trade a goal. He ended up trading, um, he ended up trading, um, you know, Andrew Hammond, but you know, he could have traded Allen, but we don't know what's going to happen with Carey Price. And Allen's only going to have one year left on his deal next year. And so if he holds on to Allen next year and he's going to be on an expiring contract, the way Hammond was, the way Kulak was, and the way Lekkinen was, he too is going to get you better value next year than he was going to get you this year after returning for only a couple of games. So you know what? I think he had a great day at the office. I think he has a plan. I think he's sticking to it. And I think the Montreal Canadiens are going to be a very, very good team for many years to come the way he wants them to be. And um, I think in about two to three years from now, you're really going to like the hockey team that he's putting together. In five years from now, I think you're going to love the hockey team that he put together. In the meantime, I'm loving the SICK podcast. I hope you are too. Tell your friends about it. Tell them to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the SICK podcast. Tell them to subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's absolutely free. And grab your friends, grab your buddies, and join us at Lacage de Carry on Saturday, March 26th. Hockey night in Canada. The Montreal Canadiens host the Toronto Maple Leafs. I'll be there, part of our sick team. Behind the scenes, we'll be there. You're going to be there. Bring your friends. We'll have a great time. Tell your friends about it. This podcast is sick. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google play, and Apple podcasts. The sick podcast is brought to you by 8.6 intense by nature and Lakage. If the last time you went to Lakage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you went back to Lakage. The menu will surprise you. <laughs>